a part of our hobby that has a steep learning curve but is often necessary for advancing in the hobby is soldering. So I've brought the guys in from SRA Soldering Products to answer a few of your questions and talk about soldering here on Coffee and Trains. Welcome everybody to another edition of Coffee and Trains. Before we begin, I am drinking Community's Coffee and Chicory and as always, black with two sugars. Which, by the way, um, I found out about this coffee from a commenter on a previous episode of Coffee and Train. So if you have coffees that you like or what you're drinking right now, go ahead and leave that in the comments below. Uh, gives me new ideas for new coffees to try. So today's video is going to be all about soldering. Soldering is one of those things that is very, very intimidating to a lot of people, but is often necessary for getting further on into the model railroading hobby. So I brought the guys in from SRA Soldering Products. They are very, very knowledgeable. They are experts in their field and they have a lot to say when it comes to soldering and they're looking to help out model railroaders in their hobby in terms of soldering. So let's go ahead and check out this conversation. Today on Coffee and Trains, we have a very, very special episode. We got some special guests from SRA Soldering Products. We have Randy and Sam. Uh, tell me guys a little bit about SRA Soldering Products. So SRA Soldering Products started out in 1962 by my father. I was only three years old at the time. So we've been around quite a while. I took over the company in uh, 1999. And the company first started selling to the jewelry manufacturers in Rhode Island. That's kind of how the business started. So we offered solder and flux, um, a lot of precious metal solders and silver and gold. And then in the, um, probably the 1990s, we started getting into the electronics industry, offering rosin fluxes and no clean fluxes. And when I joined, it was at the beginning of the internet. So we started our first iteration of an online store. Um, and then we kept on moving forward um, and a lot of our business is now online. <clears throat> we sell on Amazon, user channels, Amazon, eBay, and our own website. And our own website is really where we're putting most of the effort in and uh, making up kits for hobbyists. Like there's a model train kit that I think James will be discussing later. So we've kind of geared that and we are starting to, you know, set up kits for specific hobbies um, as a way to get to more people. We have, um, it's pretty easy to navigate website. So that's kind of the direction we went in. We also started selling soldering irons, power supplies, uh, ultrasonic cleaners, because they all go on and go with electronics. And um, always looking for new, new product ideas and we're always coming up with new fluxes and new types of wires and diameters and so forth. So we got one of the largest selections of fluxes and solders in the world in that regard. You source a lot of your materials right here in the U.S., correct? Correct. All of our solders, all of our fluxes are sourced in the U.S., out of, made out of virgin material. Um, the solders that you get overseas are not as good a quality because they'll use recycled material. Uh, there could be in, impurities in there. So we use virgin material, which means it's never been used on another product or another solder or something. So there's no uh, impurities on it. You guys created this model railroad soldering kit, and I have never seen anyone do that. And I think it's something really cool. It's really cool to see um, people and businesses that are outside of the hobby trying to do something for model railroaders, because a lot of time, it's trying to figure out something else that'll work within the hobby. So talk about a little bit of the inspiration for that. Yeah, so we recognize that uh, there's a lot of, there's many different hobbies out there where that require soldering. And we just want to make it easier for anyone to get into it and not have any kind of, barriers there because they're not sure what they should buy or how to use it. So we felt that working with someone that's very knowledgeable in each hobby space, we can actually create something 
that provides way more value in giving them exactly the tools and um, knowledge that someone who's actually doing it every day is going to use. Three main materials you'll see in model railroading are stainless steel with some of the really cheaper stuff. Or not stainless steel, but just plain old steel. Um, you'll see the, the nickel, silver, so mainly nickel. And then you'll also see brass. Um, so talk a little bit about what choosing the right uh, solder and flux combination for those is going to do for your soldering experience with those different materials. Sometimes with brass, you're going to need an acid flux just because brass can oxidize and a, a rosin flux won't work that well on brass. Typically when you're soldering, a lot of times you haven't done any of the, the track and ballast. So um, talk a little bit about what, how do you wash after a solder? I know you said an acid-based solder. Yeah, so we would wash with really just a hot soapy water is all you need to remove the flux. So it's not very complicated. With a rosin flux you can leave on and no clean you can leave on. Um, but if you do want to remove the residue from a no clean to make it look prettier, you'll use like an alcohol. Uh, Talk about what someone needs to do to find the right temperature. Is there, I know you have the soldering guide, like is there... A, is there a rule of thumb for finding the right temperatures for soldering different materials? So in regards to finding the right heat and temperature, um, you want to be high enough to get the job done, but low enough not to damage your parts and burn up your wires and lift your pads on your circuit board, whatever it is. So one of the... So the way that I would recommend finding the right temperature is to look at the part you're about to solder and ask yourself, what's it made of? Is it a sensitive part? And how, how large is it? Yeah, larger parts will need more heat. So that's one thing that you'll know if you're hitting something up large, you're gonna use a larger tip and more heat or a higher temperature part. So that's why it's good to have a iron that has adjustable temperature on. Looking for the type of wires and soldering. I know I always have more difficulty soldering solid stranded wire than I do braided simply because it's way easier to tend braided wire. You just have a drop and it's good. Um, really, when it, what's a good technique for soldering that solid wire? So with solid wire, the best thing to do, you should always try tinning your wire first. Um, you know, cut it to length, tin it. So by tinning, I mean putting some solder on it. So the easiest way to do that is to use um, like a rosin flux, dip the end of the wire in. And then if you had a solder pot, if you're doing autumn, you could buy a small solder pot. If you don't, you just use an iron and you put a little solder on the um, wire and then makes it easier to solder to your joints that way you don't have to put as much heat on. Once it's already pre-tinned, it makes it much easier. One of the questions that I think I, I swear 10 people asked the same question was talking about tips and when to use what tip. And I think what the real concern is like with soldering track and is like trying to get it, your wires soldered without melting. So really talking about tip usage and when to use what tip, like which one is your scalpel, which one is your hammer? So there's three considerations to make when you're choosing a tip. Um, the more surface area there is that you have to heat, like the larger the parts, the longer it's gonna take. So choosing a tip with a larger surface area is gonna give you a bigger contact patch between your iron tip and the piece for more heat to transfer quickly. So that speeds up the process of how long you have to stay on your joint. So by choosing a larger tip for a larger joint, you can heat it up quicker and not risk damaging everything. And then you also want to consider the shape and size of the tip. Um, so will it fit into where you need it to? Um, for example, the conical, the cone-shaped tip is going to give you the smallest 
footprint of all of them. So that is usually the best for getting in the tight spaces. Um, and even the bevel and chisel, they all come in a variety of sizes. So you basically want to pick one that's going to fit into the space you're soldering without damaging the things around it, but that also has adequate enough surface area to heat up your joint. And then um, the final thing um, you could consider would be the specialty soldering tips, which might come in handy for specific operations like drag soldering with a knife tip or um, soldering surface mount devices with a curved conical tip that makes it a little bit easier to get in there since it's got the curve. What are some of the tools that you guys have that are your go-tos for soldering that have proven to be the most helpful in general? I know there's specific things um, for specific moments, but what are the most like in general, like if I'm gonna have a toolbox with four or five tools in it for soldering, like what are those four or five tools gonna be that's gonna get me through most situations? I would say if you were gonna buy only one soldering accessory to make your life easier, it should be a pair of helping hands, a vise, or some other type of soldering jig because movement is your greatest enemy in making a reliable soldering joint. So if the component or wire moves while the solder is still in its molten state, you risk the chance of a cold solder joint occurring. And you definitely don't want that because then your circuit might not work or work intermittently. And so yeah, having helping hands like be these simple ones or any number of different ones out there, even cardboard you could use as a jig to hold your parts. Just as important as stopping movement is ensuring that the surfaces you're soldering are clean and in good condition. So most stations will come with a sponge for cleaning off solder and flux. And the flux is what really eats away at the plating on your tip. And it's also what smokes when it's left on it. So the wet sponge is highly effective in removing those residues, but the only downside to it is that it momentarily drops the tip temperature by shocking the iron with the water. So I would also recommend the brass coil cleaner as an accessory because this will let you clean the residues without water and you can instantly keep working on your project. So I like to use both of them together. If you were to get a hobbyist one soldering iron that's going to last them a while, that's going to work great, um, that with just some maintenance and care is going to is going to be with them for years to come, which one would you get them? Well, for electronic soldering, you're going to want to have an iron that's at least 40 watts. Um, if you go for a higher wattage, you want to make sure that it has a variable temperature control. And so I would definitely recommend getting an iron that has adjustable temperature, whether it's just a knob or a digital control, because a simple AC powered iron of more than 40 watts is going to give you too much heat and you'll likely start damaging things. But if it's controlled temperature, that extra wattage that your iron has becomes an asset to you, meaning you can have more power in reserve to heat larger areas without the tip temperature dropping dramatically. And you don't want to run out of heat when you're trying to heat something up because it will, you'll, you're, the solder will stop melting and your stuff will get stuck to it, you know? So but Also, lead-free solder has a higher melting temperature, so you need more power for lead-free solder versus solder with lead. Digitally controlled, maybe 60, 60 watts and one that has a replaceable heating element or even iron because eventually you know, you're going to have to replace those once you've, once it's run through so many heat cycles and it dies. <laughs> Let's go ahead and talk about the company and why you should pick SRA solder. Um, I think it's a pretty easy decision in my opinion because of mainly the service after the sale. But Okay, the reason you should pick us is we have uh, high quality materials, like I mentioned before, that it's virgin material solder made in the USA, all the fluxes are made in the USA, and we're constantly developing 
new solders and new fluxes for different needs you have in your in the soldering world. And also we have a very good technical support department um, who knows has been soldering. They've been doing it a good part of their life as a hobby. Um, they've learned while they've been here, they've learned more about different applications. So they're very knowledgeable. So we're always on the phone, always able to answer emails and any questions you may have. Um, and we will not try to push a sale on you. We're just here to support you and support um, any technical questions you may have. You just purchase a cheap iron on Amazon or at Home Depot. There's no one you can call to ask if you have questions or need spare parts. And so we think that's one of the big appeals of coming to someone like us because any questions you have about it or how to use the products you just bought, we can help you with that. And we also just created a soldering guide that walks you through all the different tools and techniques that we recommend when just starting out soldering to get the best results. Yeah, we're really, we're just invested in your success in your hobby. Well, Sam and Randy, I want to thank you guys so much for hanging out, talking a lot about soldering. Um, hopefully, we've given some tips and tricks and some ideas and some new ways to do things to all the model railroaders that are watching right now. And I really want to thank you guys for looking out for model railroaders in terms of creating the kit. Um, I, I can't overstate how awesome that is for a company that's not really heavily involved in model railroading to do something for the model railroading community like that. So it means a lot. You can check them out, um, srasolder.com. Um, I have a link to that kit in the description below of this video. So thank you guys so, so much for joining me. I want to say a big thank you to Sam and Randy at SRA Soldering Products. They are very, very knowledgeable and they are looking to help people out in terms of soldering. They're really, really great guys. Definitely check them out. I've got a link to their website as well as the model railroad solder kit that they have designed in the description below. So you can check that out. So let's get on to the coffees that you guys like. Now I take these from the comments of the previous week's video and holy crap, did you guys love commenting on last week's video. Matter of fact, so much that I'm gonna link that right up here so you guys can can check that out. It, it, was, a, it was a bit of a doozy, but getting into the coffees that you're drinking, uh, Fred Cookerly is drinking a plain old Spanish cafe con lychee that sounds absolutely delicious. Let's see here. <laughs> uh, Ian Isaac says, drinking a small McDonald's, no sugar, and a lot of half and half. I'm about to get bashed by the coffee snobs. No, you're not. Coffee's coffee. I mean, there's great coffee, and then there's just coffee. And if you like coffee, it's great. So <laughs> it's just like model railroading. If you like it, then it's right. Let's see here. Uh, who else do we have? Uh, Chris Praxton says that he is drinking Kicking Horse Decaf Bean Coffee. He says, I figure if I'm going to decaffeinate, I might as well have some freshly ground quality coffee. Excellent. I'll have to put Kicking Horse on my list. Let's see here. Jack Green said that he likes any dark roast or Colombian. The key for him is grinding the beans when they brew it. Excellent. I love tips like that as well when it comes to coffee. Let's see here. NW24153NS says... Um, coffee, nope, I gave up that. Now I drink the Republic of Tea, blueberry green with a little bit of lemon. That sounds actually pretty good. I'm not opposed to drinking some tea. So thank you guys so, so much for watching. Thank you for telling me the coffees that you're drinking. And I want to say a big thank you to all of my patrons. They're listed right here. You can become a patron for as little as $1 a month. You get exclusive access to content and polls and images and a lot of other things. And like I said, you can join that for just $1 a month. There's a link in the description below. Until next time, I'm Jimmy from the DIY and Digital. Stay safe, be kind, drink some coffee, and happy railroading.